So in the previous lesson, what we did was spend some time talking about the idea of federalism within the US constitutional framework. Uh, this lesson is going to continue talking about federalism, but just add a little bit of uh, an historical analysis of this particular topic. Now, the reason why this is important is because the idea of federalism, while explicitly stated and, and clearly enumerated in the previous lesson, let's say, um, it's still a system that ebbs and flows to a degree. And it has done in history where there has been a greater and, and lesser degrees of federalism and, and greater and lesser degrees of tension uh, within the federal system. So uh, specifically, we'll just talk about the historical development of federalism itself. And I want to begin by looking at this particularly long period of time. OK, this is a period of U.S. history that takes us from the start of the U.S. Constitution all the way up to the 1930s, the Great Depression. This is what was known as a period of layer cake federalism. And this is because the U.S. operated under a system of dual federalism, where you have where the federal and state governments each operated within their own distinct spheres of influence. And where this existed, why it made essentially a situation where there was very, very limited overlap. And that's why it's called layer cake um, federalism, because it was a period of time for the majority of US history. In fact, it was a period of time in which there were clear layers of authority and these layers didn't necessarily cross in any meaningful sense. This is known as the early period of federalism. We then start to see a shift, OK, uh, from the 1930s into the 1960s, this sort of 30 year gap. This is a shift in which we start to develop an idea known as uh, cooperative federalism and it be it's partially due to the fact that we get the great depression so in 1929 of course we get the the wall street crash the great depression we get the failure to deal with the great depression by president hoover and then we also get the election of uh, president roosevelt who then brings in the new deal okay if you want to know more about this, we do have some A-level history lessons looking at this on the America Making a Superpower module. Um, if you're somebody who's studying A-level history and studying that module specifically, you'll be very, very familiar with this topic. If not, and you want to have a little look over um, how the New Deal worked and what the New Deal was, we have those lessons on that playlist. Now, the Great Depression and the New Deal era essentially brought about this idea of cooperative federalism. This is where we see the federal and the state governments beginning to work together to more closely address national problems. The main national problem, of course, was the Great Depression, a very long, uh, a very prolonged period of quite extensive and extreme poverty for most people. This area, uh, sorry, this era from the sort of 1930s Going into the 1940s, of course, then we get the Second World War. Uh, the Second World War is really where the U.S. emerges as a major superpower, OK, uh, the major superpower, um, uh, one of two major superpowers into this as we then enter into the 50s and 60s, where we get the Cold War. And it's really where we see the introduction of federal programs that involves significant cooperation with the between state and federal governments uh, and are often funded by federal grants the reason why this was the case of course is because the great depression and the new deal um required so much cooperation to solve quite substantial and quite significant economic problems during this period this period is sometimes described as uh, marble cake federalism, where the boundaries between the, the, the layers of the federal government and the state governments become more blended, become more blurred. And so we get this idea of a marble cake federalism. Today, though, we have an idea known as modern federalism. This takes us from sort of the, the 1970s into the present day. Um, it is characterized by efforts to return uh, more power, more authority and more responsibility back to the states. So presidents like Richard Nixon on the one hand and then Ronald Reagan on the other hand advocated for a process of devolution in a similar sense of devolution that we get in the United Kingdom, where we transfer powers away from the central administration to, to, to more local administrations. 
that's how devolution uh, works in relation to the United Kingdom's political system. The sort of Nixon Reagan eras of devolution sought to achieve this kind of thing happening uh, with powers being transferred away from the federal government back to the state governments. This period saw a push for block grants, which essentially give states more discretion in how federal funds are spent. And today, federalism continues to evolve and it continues to see growing debates over the balance of power between the federal and state governments. So issues, for example, like healthcare, education, and what will be increasingly um, more uh, prominent in future uh, in the future is things like environmental regulation. Um, uh, these becomes very central debates within the the, the shift of, of power between the states and the federal government. It should also be noted that immigration is mentioned on this slide. Immigration seems to be the central issue in the current US presidential election that is taking place in 2024 this lesson will be released in and around the time at which we actually uh, get the the uh, the US election results um so essentially or at least uh, at least on on the minds of the GOP, the Republican Party, they want to make and to maintain immigration as being a front and center of the debates, um, specifically immigration uh, in uh, in uh, from Mexico, the southern border, uh, and the, the the way in which immigration is being dealt with by 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 the Democrats. There, that is seen as a central issue and a central uh, political issue within the current uh, U.S. political debate in the current U.S. 2024 election. So with all this being said, I'm, I'm sort of representing this idea of federalism as being quite a jovial and quite a nice relationship between the states, and the federal government. Um, but in fact, in history, throughout the history of the US, of course, there have been major tensions within federalism uh, and major tensions between the federal government and the state governments. Uh, numerous disputes about the extent of state power versus the extent of federal power major conflicts and debates over civil rights, the regulation of commerce, um, and the administration of social programs. Of course, the most significant um, conflict that was uh, the, the arising out of tensions between, um, between states and uh, between the state and the federal government is, of course, the US Civil War. This was, of course, the issue of the state's rights to allow slavery um, uh, and to maintain slavery in the southern states. They seceded from the Union in anticipation of the abolition of slavery. There wasn't actually, I believe, there wasn't actually uh, the idea of slavery being on the ballot for when, when Abraham Lincoln was elected. But, uh, and I believe it was also, there's also a very famous quote by Abraham Lincoln that said that, um, that he would choose rather to um, to keep slavery as a uh, as a uh, as an institution within the United States if it meant uh, maintaining um, maintaining the Union uh, in the way that it had been maintained if it if it meant that the the Confederate states had not seceded so the state's rights to allow slavery is a very core and prominent issue when it came to the civil war i i'll actually i'll actually readdress that for for political reasons that it was the central issue relating to the civil war it was the right for states to allow slavery there's obviously been some historical revisionism among among southern states since um uh, since the civil war since their since their loss of the the american civil war um, in which it was not about slavery it was about states rights um it was about states rights but it was about states rights to allow slavery essentially in addition to this, the U.S. Supreme Court also has played a critical role when it comes to interpreting the Constitution and when it comes to the disputes between um, federal and state um, power and authority. So um, we will look at some of these cases in the future, uh, but cases like McCulloch and Maryland, uh, Gibbons and Ogden um, are both cases that established important precedents regarding um, one of the things uh, it is, which is in relation to federalism, which is this idea of federal supremacy in when it comes to enumerated authority and enumerated powers. More recent cases include the 1995 case of U.S. and Lopez or the Sibelius case from 2012, which essentially reflected the court's continuing role in ensuring that there is a delineation of boundaries between the federal and the state authority.